Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here at the virtual seminar, New Perspectives on K&L Theory. My name is Jonathan Arpaz, and this is the first in three talks about joint work with Baptiste Calme, Emmanuel Dotto, Fabian Hebelstreit, Markus Lan, Christian Moy, Dennis Nardin, Thomas Nikolaus, and Wolfgang Steimel about new perspectives in Hermitian K-theory. Let me start with a bit of background. For a ring R, we may consider its algebraic K group, K0 of R. This is an abelian group generated by isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective R modules under the relation that says that the class of a direct sum of two modules is the sum of the two classes. This can be considered as an algebraic analog of complex K-theory of a topological space, which can be defined in a similar manner using complex vector bundles instead of projective modules. In the context of algebraic geometry, when R is commutative, K0 of R captures rich geometric information about spec of R related to its Picard group, Chow groups, and motivic homology. In the realm of geometric topology, when R is, is for example, a group ring of a group G, the reduced K group, K0 of R mod K0 of Z, detects Wall's finiteness abstraction for when a homotopy compact space with fundamental group G can be represented by an actual finite CW complex. The example of spec of R can be generalized to sufficiently nice algebraic varieties and schemes by considering isomorphism classes of vector bundles instead of projective modules and enforcing the relation F equal E plus G for every short exact sequence E goes to F goes to G of vector bundles. This generalizes the direct sum relation which corresponds to the case of a split short exact sequence. In a similar manner, for commutative R, we may consider the grotendieck weed group, GW0 of R, which is the abelian group generated by isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective modules equipped with a unimodular quadratic form under a similar type of relation which says that the class of a direct sum is the sum of the two classes. Now, if you consider K0 as an analog of complex K-theory, the grotendieck weed group can be considered as an analog of real K-theory of a topological space. In fact, for a complex vector bundle, the data of a unimodular quadratic form on that bundle is essentially equivalent to the data of a reduction of its st structure field from the complex numbers to the real numbers. There are two natural ways to relate grotendieck weed group and K0. One is the forgetful map that takes the class of a projective module equipped with a unimodular form and simply forgets the form. On the other hand, for a projective module, we may associate the corresponding hyperbolic class. This is the class whose underlying module is a direct sum of P with its dual, and the form is then given by the associated evaluation form on this guy. We call this the hyperbolic class associated to P and to this map the hyperbolic map. And again, um, we can generalize to sufficiently nice algebraic varieties and schemes by considering vector bundles equipped with unimodular quadratic forms. In this case, again, we need to add a few relations. More specifically, we need to re add a relation that says that whenever E is a vector bundle equipped with a unimodular quadratic form that admits a Lagrangian subbundle, so that is a maximal isotropic subbundle, then the class of EQ is equal to the hyperbolic class associated to L. If we take the co-kernel of the hyperbolic map, then we get what is known as the wheat group. We may then consider the wheat group is, can then be described as the abelian group generated by isomorphism classes of uh, finitely generated projective modules equipped with unimodular quadratic forms, modulo the relation that says that hyperbolic forms are zero. Uh, this group goes back to the seminal work of wheat, who defined and studied this group in the case of fields. We, we then obtain an exact sequence of this form, where this is the quotient map from the grotendieck wheat group to the wheat group. And this is the hyperbolic map that descended to the C2 orbits of K0. Here, the group C2, the group with two elements, acts on K0 by sending a, the class of a projective module to the class of its dual. The hyperbolic map that sends a class of P to the associated hyperbolic class is invariant under this, this action and hence descends to the C2 orbits with the same image. And so we obtain an exact sequence. Though we should emphasize that this map is usually not injective. So this does not extend to a short exact sequence. Uh, these sequences are, however, is a, however very useful in practice to obtain information about the grotendieck weed group from information about the weed group and information about K0, which are often more accessible than the grotendieck weed group directly. 
for example, when R is the integers, K0 of, of the integers is just Z with the isomorphism given by the rank, and the weak group of the, the integers is also Z with the isomorphism given by the signature divided by 8. This, short exact, this exact sequence then splits and giving us the GW of Z is Z, time, Z direct sums Z. When R is a field, um, again, these two, these two external guys are again very accessible. So K0 of a field is always Z, and the weight group of a field can be very efficiently accessed via its filtration by the uh, powers of the fundamental ideal, whose associated graded are isomorphic to uh, suitable Galois cohomology groups with coefficients in Z mode 2. This is essentially the content of the famous Milner's conjecture, which was proven by Vervotsky. Uh, in practice, this makes the, this makes the width group of a field very accessible to computations. And so if we look at this um, exact sequence, which is not a short exact sequence, it, it really looks like it's the tail of a long exact sequence. But with what, what groups? So on the, on the side of algebraic K theory, extending K0 to higher groups um, was, there were several attempts on how to do that. In the end, it's, it was the definition of Quilland that, um, that worked best. Uh, Quilland defined this not exactly as I wrote here. He defined the higher K groups using the plus construction, but this is equivalent to the following definition. So if we, if we consider the definition of K0, as a form of a group completion, we had the we can consider it as obtained in the following manner: we took uh, isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective modules, we considered this set of isomorphism classes as a monoid, and then we turned it into a group in a universal manner uh, by adding inverses. This procedure is called a group completion, and it can simply be done in a in the context of spaces instead of the context of sets. So for this. We consider not just isomorphism classes of uh, projective modules, but the entire groupoid of finitely generated projective modules and remembering all the isomorphisms between them. This is a symmetric monoidal groupoid, where the, the monoidal structure is given by direct sums. A symmetric monoidal groupoid can also be considered as an infinity monoid in spaces. So we can translate the groupoid into a space, for example, by taking its nerve and obtaining a kant simplicial set, which can be considered as a space. As a space, it has a, an infinity monoid structure. So here, infinity means that it's a commutative monoid structure, but commutative in the homotopy coherence sense. This infinity monoid in spaces can then be group completed to obtain an infinity group, uh, which is the algebraic K-theory space of R. The higher K groups are then the homotopy groups of this space. In a similar manner, we can define the Gothendieck width space. This definition was uh, first given by Karubi and Villamayor. Uh, again, first uh, in the form of a group comp uh, of a plus construction, but this is equivalent to a, to a, a group completion definition via the what is known as the group completion theorem. So again, here we, we do a similar thing where instead of taking the groupoid of finitely generated projective modules, we take the groupoid of finitely generated projective modules equipped with uh, unimodular quadratic forms. Again, we consider this uh, groupoid as an infinity monoid in spaces, and we infinity group complete it to obtain an infinity group, the Gothendieck width space. And we go back to this, to our exact sequence, and when 2 is invertible, this sequence uh, indeed extends to a long exact sequence involving the following groups. So on the side of orbits of K0, we now put the homotopy groups of the homotopy orbits of C2 acting on the K-theory space defined in the previous slide. In the middle spot of the Gotten, where here we have the, the Gothendieck width group, we put the higher Gothendieck width groups, which are the homotopy groups of the Gothendieck width space defined in the previous slide. I should note here that this sub script CL just represents the word classical. I'm putting it here just to, um, because I will present another definition of Gothendieck width later on, and this subscript allows me to distinguish between the classical group completion definition and another definition appearing later on. But for the time being, we may ignore this subscript. And on the side of the width group, we put the quadratic L groups of R, defined by Wall and Ranitsky. And um, 
I repeat again that this works when 2 is invertible in R. And these L groups, um, I will not recall their definition here, I will give a definition in a different context uh, later on, but let me just say that um, th these quadratic width groups are defined for n any integer. They are four periodic, so L of n plus 4 is isomorphic to L of n, and L0 is the width group of quadratic forms over R. So as I mentioned, these quadratic L groups were defined by Wall and Ranitsky in the context of surgery theory. In that context, the relevant ring is not commutative. It is the group ring of the fundamental group of a certain space in that, is, uh, that appears in that context. And so um, to make sense of this, I should maybe first say what are quadratic forms over non-commutative rings. And there are several uh, frameworks to how to define this. Let me present one. Um, which is, as far as I know, is sufficiently general to encompass uh, all those appearing in the literature. And it's, it's the following formalism. So for an associative ring R, we consider the notion of a module with involution over R. And uh, this is an R tensor R module. So in other words, it's something which has uh, two actions of R, and these two actions commute with each other or res respect each other. In addition, M is endowed with an involution, tau, which is linear with respect to the flip isomorphism of R tensor R. So if we act with R tensor S on an element M and then we apply uh, sigma, which should be tau, then it's the same as S tensor R after applying the involution. And this notion of a module with involution allows us to define um, a, a general notion of a quadratic form which can work for R which is not commutative. And we consider the following three notions. So for first, a, a bilinear form can be defined as follows. We simply consider the notion of a, a R tensor R module homomorphism from P tensor P to M. This makes sense since M is an R tensor R module. Now, uh, on this group, so we would consider this group as the group of bilinear M-valued forms on P. And on this group, we have a C2 action, which is obtained by flipping the, the components in the domain and acting with the given involution on the target M. And if we take the fixed points with respect to this action, then we get a natural notion of a symmetric M-valued form on P. On the other hand, if we take the C2 orbits, then we get a natural notion of a quadratic M-valued form. Uh, unlike the case of symmetric form, this might seem less intuitive uh, when um, encountered for the first time. So for this, I would uh, recommend to um, really unwind the definition in detail in the case when R is commutative and M is simply R, with the two commuting R actions just being the standard action of R on itself, and the involution simply being the identity. In this case, it is an exercise to prove that this orbit group is naturally isomorphic to the group of quadratic forms on P. And there is yet a third kind of, of, uh, of forms that we can define in this context, the notion of even forms. And this is defined by considering the norm map from orbits to fixed points. Uh, this is a map that can be defined in general whenever we have a C2 action on, a, on an abelian group. We can take the orbit uh, of a, we can take a, a given orbit and sum the elements in that orbit to obtain a, a symmetric element. So here, the orbit of a bilinear form beta goes to the symmetrization of beta, giving us a symmetric form. And this map is also known as the polarization map from quadratic forms to symmetric forms. Symmetric forms in the image of this map are called even forms. So even forms are those symmetric forms which admit a quadratic refinement. And we would like to also have a way to speak of unimodular quadratic forms. Uh, in order for this to make sense, we enforce also the condition that M is invertible. So by, by this we mean that first M is finitely generated and projective as an R module. Note that there are two ways to forget a, a module with involution over R to an R module because we have two R actions. However, the involution on M switches between these two R actions. So the underlying uh, R module of M, whether we take the first action or the second action, we get isomorphic R modules. So we, we require that M is finitely generated and projective with respect to either one of these R actions. In addition, we require that the map from R to home Rm, a map that makes sense here because we have two commuting R actions. So the second R action can be encoded via homomorphism of rings from R 
to maps of R modules from M to itself with respect to the first R action. And we require that this map would be an isomorphism. And given an invertible module with involution over R, we obtain an induced duality on the category of projective R modules. So it's a contravariant equivalence from projective R for from the category of finitely generated projective R modules to itself, which sends P to the group of homomorphisms, R module homomorphisms from P to M. So these R module homomorphisms are defined with respect to the first R action, but since M has a second R action which is compatible with the first R action, this abelian group has a residual R action on it, so we can consider it again as an R module. And this gives us a contravariant functors from finitely generated projective R modules to itself. Given any bilinear M valued form or a symmetric bilinear M valued form on P, so an R tensor R module homomorphism from P tensor P to M. This gives us an induced, homomor induced homomorphism from P to home PM, that is the M, M value dual of P. And we say that beta is unimodular if this, uh, if this map is an isomorphism. So this is for a bilinear or a symmetric bilinear form. And if we have a quadratic, quadratic form, we say that it's unimodular if its polarization is a unimodular symmetric form. So here is a summary of the definition of an invertible module with involution. And let's consider some examples. So the basic example is when R is commutative, we take M to simply be R uh, um, with the standard. Uh, so the two commuting R modules are the standard action of R in itself. We can take the involution to just be the identity. And this gives us the usual notion of unimodular, symmetric and quadratic forms, as well as even forms. We can take R to be commutative, M again M equal R, but this time with the sign involution. In this case, we get the notions of skew symmetric and skew quadratic forms. We can take R to be a ring with an anti-involution, so an involution on R which induces an isomorphism between R and R op. So it's it switches between so sigma of AB is sigma B times sigma A. Examples of such rings are group rings, which admit an anti-involution obtained by sending the additive generator G associated to an element of the group uh, G to the inverse of G. Uh, so given an, uh, a ring R with an anti-involution, we can take M to be just R. We have two commuting R actions. One is the um, standard left action of R on itself. The other comes from the right action of R on itself, which is normally an um, action of R op, considered as an action of R via the, via the anti involution. We can then endow M with the involution given by sigma itself, or we can also twist it by a central unit which satisfies this equality. Uh, for example, we can twist the action by a sign. And when R is commutative, we can also take M to not be R, but uh, some other line bundle with involution over spec R. Um, this would be the natural thing to do if we are in the context of algebraic geometry, and this example also naturally extends to the context of schemes. And in this generality, we can define the uh, L groups. Um, so the definition naturally extends to this generality. Um, since I, I didn't specify the definition yet, I, let me, I just say that the definition extends. And uh, when you extend it to this generality, there is a certain advantage, advantage that comes up, that the four, fourfold periodicity can be refined to a, a, a twofold skew periodicity, that is an isomorphism between the quadratic L group at n plus 2 of Rm is isomorphic to the quadratic L group at degree n, of R with coefficients in minus M, where minus M is obtained from M by twisting the involution by a sign. And as before, L0 of Q is the weight group of M-valued forms. So we take the group generated by isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective modules equipped with a unimodular M-valued form, and we mod out by the hyperbolic forms. And uh, similarly, the, the Gothendieck weight group uh, and the Gothendieck with space uh, can be generalized to this setting in a very straightforward manner. So instead of taking the groupoid um, that we had before, we now take a, a similar groupoid of finitely generated projective R modules, this time equipped with a unimodular M-valued quadratic form. 
And again, we consider it as an infinity monoid in spaces and we infinity group complete it to obtain an infinity group. Its group of components, GW0RM, is then the Gotten Dick group of such forms. And a an completely analogous definition can be made for symmetric or even forms in the context of R and M. And the formation of polarization gives us natural maps from the quadratic GW space to the even GW space to the symmetric GW space. These maps are all equivalences when 2 is invertible in R. So let's revisit our exact sequence. So when 2 is invertible, we can indeed extend this to a long exact sequence involving the higher groups that we just presented. So what what would be in this long exact sequence in the place of GW0 would be all the higher Gothendieck grid groups. Um, here we would have the quadratic L groups of R with coefficients in M. And here we would have the uh, homotopy groups of the homotopy orbits of C2 acting on uh, the algebraic K space of R. So here I, I wrote KRM. This is simply K of R, but with the C2 action that is associated to the M value duality. Um, and this long exact sequence is, is very. Uh, useful because it allows us to reduce the study of Gothendieck weed groups uh, to the study of algebraic K theory, including the higher K theory groups. And if, because of the, the, the two folds Q periodicity, on the side of the L groups, we just need to understand four groups L0 and L1 with M and minus M. And these four groups are uh, relatively um, accessible and computable. Unfortunately, this completely fails when 2 is not invertible. So if we try to ask ourselves um, uh, what, could be, what groups can we put here to make these higher groups, so um, given that we, we have the higher GW groups and we have the um, higher groups here taken by the, the homotopy groups, um, of the C2 orbits of K-theory, there are groups that we can put instead of L0. These would be the relative homotopy groups of this map. However, this map, these groups are in general not 4-periodic, nor are they skewed 2-periodic. And in general, when 2 is not invertible, it was uh, quite mysterious what are these groups. So what are they? Uh, answering this question uh, is one of the main applications of the framework that I am about to present. In order to explain the framework that we we offer for for Gothendieck weed theory, I need to first go back to algebraic K theory and explain the categorical approach to algebraic K theory. This categorical approach would be the one that we would like to generalize uh, for Gothendieck weed theory. So. A classical observation is that the algebraic K groups that we defined for R are actually dependent only on a certain category associated to R, the category of finitely generated projective R modules. Uh, in order to apply the group completion machinery, we only need we also needed that there would be the operation of direct sum, direct sums which um, allowed us to endow this groupoid with an infin infinity structure. Uh, then we could gen group complete to an infinity group, and so we can define. Uh, these um, algebraic K groups for any additive category. So an additive category is a category in which um, products and comproducts coincide, giving us direct sums, um, in which case we can define the associated symmetric monodal groupoid, group complete it to obtain an infinity space, and take the homotopy groups of this space as the higher K groups of the additive category. Uh, in which case we can um, uh, reproduce the algebraic K groups of a ring as the algebraic K groups of the category of projective R modules. Um, variants and generalization of this approach were suggested, so I couldn't define the higher algebraic K theory of exact categories using a Q what was called the Q construction. And Waldhausen um, constructed higher algebraic K theory of cofibration categories using what is known as the S construction. And this allows, for example, to take into account also the case of vector bundles. And from the matter, modern perspective, um, a, a useful point of view, a good point of view for uh, higher K theory 
is the context of stable infinity categories. Now, I should say that um, uh, in many in many ways, the um, K theory of uh, higher categories it was already encompassed in in these classical works. Um, for example, Waldhausen considered also K theory of configuration categories with weak equivalences, which allows one also to encode higher categories such as. Uh, infinity categories and stable infinity categories. And a, lo a lot of the results about uh, um, algebraic K theory of higher categories is in fact already in the classical setup. So what are infinity categories? Um, so I will not give a precise definition and will not say too much about it because of lack of time. But uh, if you are not familiar with this notion, please don't stop listening. Instead, just really think of it as um, simply uh, an analog of the usual notion of a category that is simply adapted to the setting of uh, homotopy theory and homological algebra. In this context, one may speak not just of objects and morphisms, but also about homotopies between morphisms, homotopies between homotopies, etc. And every ordinary category can be considered as an infinity category. So infinity categories is an extension of the classical theory of categories. But in addition, also every space can be considered as an infinity category whose objects are the points and morphisms are the paths. So the homotopies between morphisms would be homotopies between paths, etc. This association, in fact, identifies in a suitable sense the notion of a space with that of an infinity groupoid, that is, an infinity category in which all morphisms are invertible. And this idea is known as Grothendieck's homotopy hypothesis. So some infinity categories of interest that we will care about. So first and foremost, we have the infinity category of spaces. So this can be defined by taking a suitable category of sufficiently nice spaces, such as CW complexes, or alternative working with simplicial sets or uh, consimplicial sets. And this plays a role analogous to the role played by the category of sets uh, in category theory. We will also have the, the infinity category of spectra. Uh, this infinity category, uh, roughly speaking, is obtained from the infinity category of spaces by declaring the operation of suspension as invertible. Um, this infinity category, in many ways, can be considered as an analog of the category of abelian groups. Uh, this analogy should be taken with a grain of salt to the extent that there are several objects in higher category theory that can be considered as an analogs of abelian groups. Uh, from our point of view, we will choose spectra uh, as that analog. Um, in, in classical algebraic topology, the notion of spectra was developed in order to classify cohomology theories on spaces. And it was classically, it, only the um, homotopy category of spectra was available, and it was called the, the stable homotopy category. And it was later refined to an infinity category of spectra. And inside spectra, there is a full subcategory of interest. We see the full subcategory of finite spectra, which are um, obtained um, by uh, from building blocks of cells in finitely many steps. Um, and these are somehow the analog of finitely generated abelian groups. Uh, an infinity category that we will care a lot about is the derived infinity category of a ring. Uh, so. Uh, again, classically in homological, in homological algebra, one worked with the homotopy category of this infinity category, the, which was uh, classically called the derived category of, the, of a ring, obtained by taking chain complexes and then uh, formally inverting quasi-isomorphisms uh, to obtain a category. The derived infinity category is obtained by doing this procedure, but not in the realm of categories, but in the realm of infinity categories. And the classical derived category can be rep um, obtained as the homotopy category of the derived infinity category of a ring. And this will play the role, um, the analog of the category of R modules uh, in classical category theory. And we will have a full subcategory uh, that we will especially care about. It's the subcategory that corresponds to those objects which can be represented by finite complexes or bounded complexes of finitely generated projective R modules. And this would be the analog of the ordinary category of finitely generated projective R modules. Uh, and finally, in the case of a scheme or an algebraic variety, we have the infinity category of perfect complexes of quasi-coherent sheaves on a scheme. And uh, this would be the analog of vector bundles on X. 
Um, and so as a rule of thumb, um, one should, um, one can say that uh, familiar notions from ordinary category theory uh, very often extend to the realm of infinity categories with very similar behavior. So in particular, we can speak of functors between infinity categories, limits and co-limits, adjunctions, etc. So again, if you're not familiar with infinity categories, simply imagine that these are the usual notions from category theory suitably interpreted. And um, the type of infinity categories that we will work with are those that are stable. So an infinity category is said to be stable if it admits a zero object as first. A zero object is an object that is both initial and terminal. Um, second, we would like this infinity category to admit push-outs and pullbacks. So these are particular types of limits and co-limits. And finally, the most important property, we would like that uh, the collection of push-out and pullback squares coincide. So a given square is a push-out square if and only if it is a pullback square. In this case, one simply refers to these squares as exact squares. And exact squares in which one non-diagonal corner is zero are also known as exact sequences. And every stable infinity category is additive so that uh, products and coproducts coincides. So in a stable infinity category, we will generally speak of direct sums. Some examples of stable infinity categories. So uh, the main, like principal example of a stable infinity category are the infinity categories of spectra and finite spectra. Uh, they are both, uh, in some extent, universal as stable infinity categories. So more precisely, finite spectra is uh, the, uh, infinity category obtained from finite spaces by forcing it to be stable. Uh, so there is a, um, a suspension infinity functor from finite spaces to finite spectra. And finite spectra is um, universal uh, as a stable infinity category e equipped with a, um, a, a suitable type of functor from finite spaces. We can also say that um, finite spectra is obtained from finite spaces by inverting the suspension functor. Uh, similarly, all spectra, the large infinity category of spectra, is obtained from the large infinity category of spaces by forcing it to be stable, but this time in the realm of presentable infinity categories. Another example is the derived infinity category of a ring uh, is always stable, and also the perfect derived infinity category of perfect complexes is also stable. And finally, the infinity category of perfect complexes of quasi coherent sheaves on a scheme is also stable. Um, and in the context of stable infinity categories, we would like to speak of uh, algebraic K theory uh, of a stable infinity category. And this can be defined as follows. So for a stable infinity category C, we define the infinity category span of C. The objects of this infinity category are the same as the objects of C. And morphisms are given by spans, that is, diagrams of this kind, where we have a third object. So this is a morphism from X to Y. It's given by a third object, W, equipped with maps to X and to Y. Homotopies between morphisms, which is something that we have in the infinity categorical world, are equivalences between spans, and so on. Um, spans can be composed by forming the fiber product over the middle object. So if we have here, if we had here another span from Y to some other object, we could we could compose it by forming the fiber product over Y, and then taking the external span that we obtain. So this yields an infinity category, which we write span of C. And a definition of K theory of a stable infinity category, given by Barwick and Rognes, by the following procedure. So we take the span infinity category of C. We then take its realization or classifying space. So what is this space? Um, so from the point of view of, of the homotopy hypothesis, if we think of spaces as the same thing as um, infinity groupoids or infinity categories in which all morphisms are invertible, so we need to explain how to take an infinity category and make out of it an infinity category in which all errors are invertible. So this can be done by a universal procedure where we declare, we add inverses formally uh, in, in, in a suitable manner to all, uh, to all errors. So there is a universal manner to make an infinity category into an infinity groupoid, and this is one way to define its realization or classifying space. Uh, another way is that 
an infinity category can always be encoded by a simplicial set, in which case we can take the geometricalization of this simplicial set and obtain a space. Finally, we then take the loop space of that space at the object zero, and we obtain the k-theory space of, of C. And the formation of direct sums, in those case, k of C with the structure of an infinity group. Um, so this definition of Bowick and Wagner's um, is built on, cla on Quillen's classical definition uh, of the algebraic K-theory of an exact category using the Q-construction. And in fact, uh, here, uh, Bowick and Wagner's uh, define this for something a, a bit more general than a stable infinity category. They define it for an exact infinity category, something that we will not touch upon here. Um, and uh, K-theory of higher categories, as I said before, already appears in Waldhausen's work in the form in the in the form of categories with cofibrations and weak equivalences. And the approach of Waldhausen with the S construction can also be adapted to the setting of stable infinity categories. So this was done by Bloomberg Gertner and Tabuada. And the S construction was also adapted by Bowick to the setting of Waldhausen infinity categories. Uh, and these two approaches to higher K-theory of stable infinity categories are both equivalent. So this was proven by Powerick and Wagner in the same paper where they discussed the Q-construction for exact infinity categories. Um, yeah, so we have this definition, and what does it give in some uh, specific examples that we care about? So if we fit this, the perfect derived category of a ring, then it gives us something that is canonically equivalent to the classical K-theory space of R defined via the group completion. Um, more generally, this works for a sufficiently nice scheme or algebraic variety, the K-theory of perfect, the, the perfect uh, complexes of quasi current sheaves will give the K-theory of vector bundles. And these are particular cases of the gilles waldhausen theorem. Um, if we feed this, the uh, infinity category of finite spectra, then the K-theory space is also known as Waldhausen's a theory of the point, and this plays. This has many applications in geometric topology. And I would like now to um, uh, finally come to the setting that we propose to the study of uh, Grothendieck width theory. Um, so we consider the setting of uh, Poincaré infinity categories, which um, was already studied by Lurie in his work of, on L theory. In order to define Poincaré infinity categories, I will need to first pass by uh, several auxiliary definitions. Um, so first, consider the following. Suppose that we had a functor, between, a functor f between two stable infinity categories. Then we say that f is reduced if it preserves zero objects. We say that it is exact or linear if it preserves zero objects and exact squares. And we say that it is quadratic if it preserves zero objects and sends strongly exact three cubes to exact three cubes. Here, a three cube diagram in C is called exact if it is a limit or colimit cube. These two things would be equivalent when C is stable. Where a limit cube is a cube that presents its uh, corner as the limit of the punctured cube, and a colimit cube is one that presents its other corner as the colimit of the punctured cube in the other direction. And we say that the three-cube diagram is strongly exact if its restriction to each two-dimensional face is an exact square. And these notions are part of the general framework of Goodwilly calculus. So if we consider stable infinity categories as analogs of vector spaces, so even just think of the vector space R over the field R, and we think of a functor as a function from R to R, then reduced is simply analogous to sending zero to zero. Uh, exact or linear is analogous to being a, a linear transformation, so a function from R to R, which is of the form x goes to a times x for some a. And quadratic would be analogous to a function which has a quadratic term a and a linear term, so it's something like x squared plus 2x. Two two we could also have a more general notion if, if we remove the condition that it preserves zero object, then we get the notion that is called too excisive, and we, this would be analogous to uh, a function which has a quadratic part, a linear part, and a constant part. And now we come to um, a precursor of the definition of Poincaré infinity categories, a weaker definition of Hermitian infinity categories. 
So a Hermitian infinity category is a pair, C copa, where C is a stable infinity category, and copa is a quadratic functor from C op to spectra. A Hermitian functor between two Hermitian infinity categories consists of an exact functor from C to C prime and the natural transformation from copa to the restriction of copa prime along F. And when we, are, when we have a quadratic functor, copa, then its polarization, which is defined as follows, it's a functor in two inputs, x and y. x and y are objects in C, and this polarization is defined by taking the fiber of the map from copa of x, of x direct sum y to the direct sum of copa x and copa y. So here this direct sum is calculated in C. So as I said, C is stable, so it has products and coproducts coincide, and we simply denote them as direct sums. There is a natural map from copa of the direct sums, copa of the direct sum to the direct sums of the copa, this direct sum being calculated in spectra. If we take the fiber of this map, we get what is called the polarization of copa. And when copa is quadratic, its polarization is exact in each variable separately. And so we think of it as a bilinear functor in two inputs, and we call it the bilinear part of copa. And this bilinear part is not just a functor in two inputs, it's it is symmetric in its two inputs. It's symmetric in x and y. More precisely, so if we think of this guy as living inside this inf a certain infinity category of functors from C op times C op to spectra, on this infinity category there is an action of C2 by switching the components. And this polarization, when we um, this polarization admits a C2 fixed structure with respect to this action of sweep, switching the components. And um, this symmetry structure means in particular that if we plug in X and X, then the spectrum that we obtain here will um, carry a natural C2 action. In addition, if we restrict along the diagonal map, this gives us a natural map from B copa XX to copa x, and this map is invariant under the C2 action, and so descends to a map from the homotopy orbits of this spectrum to the spectrum copa of x. And when, x, when copa is quadratic, this cofiber will always be exact in x. And so we refer to L of copa as the linear part of copa. And in this setting, we often refer to quadratic functors from C op to spectra simply as Hermitian structures on C. And when we have a Hermitian infinity category, we consider copa of x as encoding the notion of Hermitian forms on x in the form of a spectrum. Um, and so um, we would think of uh, points in that spectrum, which are given by maps from the sphere spectrum to that spectrum, as individual Hermitian forms on X, in which case we will also call the pair XQ a Hermitian object. So um, a Hermitian infinity category should be considered simply as an abstract setting in which you can make sense of the notion of an object equipped with the Hermitian form. Here we use the adjective Hermitian because we, we want to talk about the uh, various types of forms uh, that we had for, for example, quadratic forms, symmetric forms, even forms, um, the various M's that we have. We want to have a, a generic adjective, and so we use the, the adjective Hermitian. Uh, and a canonical example to have in mind is the following. Uh, suppose we start with a ring and an invertible model with involution, as we discussed earlier. So a setting in which we can classically interpret the notions of quadratic form uh, symmetric form and even form uh, valued in M. So in this case, we consider the stable infinity category DPR, the perfect derived infinity category of R, or the infinity category of perfect complexes over R. And we introduce two Hermitian functor on this stable infinity category. Um, one is the quadratic functor that sends X. So we take this home R tensor R, X tensor X, M is a spectrum. What's, what, what is this spectrum? So X tensor X is something that lives, in, we can interpret it as living in the derived, uh, in the perfect derived infinity category of R tensor R. Um, 
M is also something that we can interpret in the derived category of R tensor R. This, uh, the derived, the perfect derived infinity category of R tensor R is stable. In any stable infinity category, we have an, a, a notion of a mapping spectrum between two objects. It is a notion that is canonically attached to, the, to that of uh, a stable infinity category. And so we can form this mapping spectrum inside the stable infinity category dp r tensor r. Um, on this mapping spectrum, there is a natural action of C2 by uh, switching the two components here and acting with the given involution on M. When we take the homotopy orbits, we get something that is a homotopy coherent analog of quadratic forms. And this organizes into a quadratic functor. So this term is quadratic in X, and this gives us a quadratic functor, contravariant in X, and hence a Hermitian structure on the perfect derived infinity category. Similarly, if we take the homotopy fixed points, then we get a homotopy coherent variant of symmetric forms. And this expression is also quadratic in X, giving us another Hermitian structure on the perfect derived infinity category of R. These two Hermitian structures have the same uh, bilinear part, which is given by taking the mapping spectrum from X tensor Y to M in the, derived, in the perfect derived infinity category of R tensor R. The example that I stated before can be considered as a homotopy coherent analog of the classical notions of symmetric and quadratic forms. As a homotopy coherent analog, uh, it is an analog, but it is not exactly um, the correct place to locate the classical counterpart. Instead, we can locate the classical counterpart as follows. Um, so in this project, we developed a machinery of uh, deriving quadratic functors. In particular, we proved the following result that says that uh, quadratic functors on the perfect derived infinity category of a ring are essentially uniquely determined by their values on projective modules. So here, projective modules are embedded inside the perfect derived category simply as those perfect complexes which are concentrated in degree zero. So if we go back for a second to the previous example. Here, if we plug in a projective module as, as, as x, then um, the value of copa q on a projective module will not exactly be the group of quadratic forms, because even though this mapping spectrum will be discrete, it will be by the, the spectrum of bilinear forms, after we, after we take homotopy orbits, we get something with which in general has higher homotopy groups uh, in arbitrarily high degrees, which usually not discrete, whereas the group of quadratic forms is a discrete group. Similarly, if we take homotopy fixed points, we get something with homotopy groups in negative degrees. Instead, if we want really the analog of the classical setting, then we can simply um, look at those quadratic functors, which by this uh, unicity result are those which satisfy the uh, determined by the property that the restriction to projective modules is given by the classical notion of quadratic forms, symmetric forms, and even forms. Um, defined by taking these, so taking instead of the mapping spectrum, just the mapping abelian group, and not taking homotopy orbits, but the actual orbits. And here, just the actual uh, fixed points instead of the homotopy fixed points, and here the image, so those symmetric forms which has a quadratic refinement. And we call this the genuine quadratic, genuine symmetric, and genuine even. So the five Hermitian structures that we defined so far are related by a sequence of natural transformations, going from the homotopy quadratic to the genuine quadratic, to the genuine even, to the genuine symmetric, to the homotopy symmetric. And all these natural transformations induce an equivalence on bilinear parts. When 2 is invertible in R, all these natural transformations are equivalences. So also the subtlety uh, that distinguishes between the homotopy coherent variant and the more rigid variant that we call the genuine, this subtlety disappears, is invisible when 2 is invertible. Uh, let us now come to the definition of Poincaré infinity category. So suppose that we have a Hermitian structure on a given stable infinity category C. We will say that COPPA is non-degenerate if there exists a, a, a functor D 
from COP to C together with a natural equivalence between B of XY to the mapping spectrum between X and D of Y. If such a D exists, then it is essentially unique, i.e. it is essentially determined by B of COPA and hence by COPA. And so we often write D of COPA to express the dependence in COPA. And we say that COPA is Poincaré if it is non-degenerate and the associated functor D is an equivalence of infinity categories. Uh, in this case, we also say that this is the duality associated to COPA. So it's an equivalence, it then in this case, it gives an equivalence between C open C. <coughs> and more precisely, it gives a, a C2 fixed structure on C inside the infinity category of infinity categories with respect to the C2 action, which sends an infinity category to its opposite. And so we arrive to the, to the main definition. A, a Poincaré infinity category is a Hermitian infinity category C COPA, such that COPA is Poincaré. And some examples. So all the five Hermitian structures that we presented in the case of uh, um, the perfect derived category of a ring um, are all Poincaré. They all have the same bilinear part and the same duality, which is the m-value duality, sending x to the mapping complex from x to m. Another example is the following. If we start with any stable infinity category, then the, the, the formation of mapping spectra gives a quadratic functor on C times C op, a Hermitian structure on C times C op. And the resulting Hermitian infinity category, uh, we then denote it by hype of C, and we call it uh, the hyperbolic uh, Hermitian infinity category associated to C. One can then prove in a straightforward manner that uh, this Hermitian structure is always Poincaré with duality that switches xy to yx. Um, and so we, we call this the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category associated to C. And finally, a, a third example, if we take the infinity category of finite spectra, then we can form the universal Hermitian structure, which is the initial Hermitian structure equipped with the Hermitian form on the sphere spectrum. It sits in a fiber sequence between home x S, S is the sphere spectrum, home X, S, and home X tensor X, S, homotopy orbits, where these homes are, again, mapping spectra. Its bilinear part is the mapping spectrum from X tensor Y to S, and it is Poincaré with duality, spinal white duality. This is X to home X, S. <coughs> and when we have a Poincaré structure, then we can speak not only on Hermitian forms on objects, but we can also say when these Hermitian forms are unimodular. So given a Hermitian form, um, this form always determines by, by looking at its image in B copa XX, we obtain an associated map from X to its dual. And we say that this Hermitian object is Poincaré if this map is an equivalence. Uh, the collection of Hermitian objects can be organized into an infinity category uh, associated to C and COPA. Infinity category whose objects are the Poincaré objects and whose morphisms are maps between the underlying objects equipped with uh, compatibility homotopy on the corresponding forms. In this infinity category, we can take the maximal infinity groupoid, uh, which so we always think of infinity groupoids also as spaces. We obtain the space of forms uh, in C. In this space of forms, we take the maximal subspace spanned by Poincaré objects. And this gives us the space of Poincaré objects in a given infinity category, Poincaré infinity category, uh, which is a fundamental invariant of a Poincaré infinity category. So um, the, maybe the simplest object of a uh, uh, a, a Poincaré object is a hyperbolic Poincaré object. So if we start with an object V, we can associate to it a canonical form on V direct sum dual V, which comes from the summand B V dual V under the identification of this with home, this should be, this C should be V, home V V. So it's the form corresponding to the identity from V to itself. And the resulting Hermitian object with underlying object V direct sum D, dual V is always Poincaré. 
If we look at the example of the, Pon the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category associated to a stable infinity category C, then in fact all Poincaré objects in this infinity category are somehow canonically hyperbolic. And this results in an equivalence between the space of Poincaré objects in hyper of C and the space of objects in C. So this is the maximal groupoid of C. And we would now like to um, start moving towards the definition of the uh, Grotendieck with space of a um, Poincaré infinity category, as well as the L groups of a Poincaré infinity category. For this, we will need the notion of a cobordism between two Poincaré objects. So a cobordism from xq to x prime q prime is a span from x to x prime, so a third object w equipped with maps to x and x prime. We can then restrict the quadratic, the Hermitian forms of x and x prime to w. So we need to specify a homotopy between these two restrictions. Such a homotopy determines a map from w to this fiber product, and we require that this map would be an equivalence. Uh, this is analogous to the Poincaré Lifshitz duality that is satisfied by uh, geometric cobordisms. Uh, in the context of manifolds. And cobordisms can be composed by first composing the spans and then composing the homotopies. As a result, the relation of being cobordant, so the relation of having a cobordisms, a cobordism between two objects, is an equivalence relation. We can, uh, if x is cobordant to, if there is a cobordism from x to x prime and a cobordism from from x prime to x double prime, then we can compose them to obtain a cobordism from x to x double prime. A given cobordism can also be read the other way, and there is also the identity cobordism from x to itself. So this is an equivalence relation, and its equivalence classes we will call uh, um, cobordism classes of Poincaré objects. We then say that the Poincaré object is metabolic if it is cobordant to zero. Unwinding the definition, uh, this means that there is a map from L to X, a null homotopy of the Hermitian form restricted to L, such that the resulting sequence L, X, DL is exact. We then also say that L is a Lagrangian in X. So this point of view unites the algebraic notion of being metabolic with the geometric notion of being null cobordant. And the, the formation of cobordisms can be, um, and cobordisms and iterated cobordisms, composable cobordisms, can be organized into what is called the Q construction. Here we, we follow um, the Hermitian adaptation of the Q construction due to Schlichting. We generalize it to our setting. And in order to define it, we need to recall the twisted arrow category of the poset n, so this is the poset of, um, so n, bracket n is simply the poset of the numbers from 0 to n. Uh, if we apply the twisted arrow category construction to this, we get something that can be explicitly described as follows. It is the partially ordered set whose elements are pairs of i and j such that j is bigger or equal than i, and such that it, there is a amorphisms, amorphism from i smaller or equal to j to i prime smaller or equal to j prime, if and only if this inequality holds, and no morphisms otherwise. Concretely, we can think of elements in this twisted arrow category as indicating sub-segments of n, so, uh, such that there is a morphism from any sub-segment to an inner sub-segment. And this leads us to the definition of the Q construction. Um, so given a Hermitian infinity category, CQ, uh, we define QN of CQ as follows. So first we define the underlying stable infinity category. It will be the full subcategory of functors from the twisted arrow category of N to C, spent by those functors such that for every quadruple I, J, K, L with these inequalities, the associated square is exact. And we then refine uh, the stable infinity category to a Hermitian infinity category by defining the Hermitian structure COPPA N to send a diagram phi to the limit over the opposite 
uh, that we see their category of copa uh, composed after phi. And if C copa is Poincare, then one can prove that these are mission infinity categories, Q and C copa, are Poincare for every n. Um, so this, this, is, this is not com completely formal. This involves some combinatorics. And in particular, this is not true if one does not restrict to this um, full subcategory. So if, one's, if one considers this Hermitian structure on the entire diagram category, it will not be Poincare. It is only Poincare when restricted to this full subcategory. Um, so let's take an example. So maybe, even before we consider this, um, if we take n being zero, then this posit just has one element zero. It's twisted there category just has one element zero, smaller or equal to zero. And Q zero C just ends up being C copa, also as a Poincare infinity category. So Q zero C copa is C copa. What about Q one C copa? So in this case, so we start with a posit uh, bracket one. It's a posit with two elements, zero and one. In the twisted arrow category, we then have three elements. We have the full segment zero, one, the segment zero, zero, and the segment one, one. And so diagrams indexed by this are simply given by uh, object X and X prime and the third object W associated to the full segment with maps to X and X prime. If we think what would be a Hermitian form on such a span, so it would be the limit of um, this diagram after I post-compose it with COPA. So by definition, this means that um, a Hermitian form on such a span would be a compatible choice of Hermitian forms on X, X prime, and W. Otherwise put, it's a choice of a Hermitian form on X, a Hermitian form on X prime, and a homotopy between their restrictions to W. And if one unwinds the definition of when such a Hermitian form is Poincaré, one exactly finds the poincare lifshitz duality condition that we had before, that it needs to induce, that the map induced from W to this fiber product is an equivalence. In other words, um, Poincaré objects in Q1 C copa uh, simply corresponds to, uh, correspond to a pair of, of Poincaré objects and the cobordism between them. Similarly, if one unwinds the definition for the uh, higher Q and C copa, one finds that Poincaré objects in Q and C copa corresponds to a sequence of incomposable cobordisms, where the full data of the diagram simply indicates is indicates all all the composites are indicated as well, and one can then form first a simplicial object in Poincaré infinity categories by taking the Q construction, and one can then apply the uh, the functor of taking Poinc Poincaré objects. This is a functor to spaces. And so this yields a simplicial space that sends n to the space of Poincaré objects in Q and C copa. And one can then show that this is a complete Siegel space, and so it encodes the structure of an infinity category. And this leads us to the definition of the cobordism infinity category of C copa. Here we have a little um, dimension shift. Um, so in order to define the cobordism infinity category of C copa, we do this construction on the, the Q construction and then taking Poincaré spaces. And not on C copa, but on C with copa shifted. So here, uh, copa bracket N would be copa uh, after we apply N fold suspension in, in, in spectra. So copa one is the suspension of copa. Uh, this dimension shift is done in order to accommodate the dimension convention in geometric cobordism categories. We then take this Q con this Hermitian Q construction, we apply Poincaré spaces, Poinc spaces of Poincaré objects, we obtain a complete Siegel space, and so it encodes an infinity category. And we call this the cobordism category or the cobordism infinity category of the Poincaré infinity category C copa. And example that I can give right away, if one takes the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category of a given stable infinity category, then 
since Poincaré space, Poinc the space of Poincaré objects in hyperbolic uh, infinity categories identifies with the underlying object, one can then show that the cobordism infinity category of the hyperbolic Poincaré category is naturally equivalent to the span infinity category of C. So this 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 notion uh, can be considered as generalizing the classical notion of spans of the span infinity category. And we can use this to define the L groups uh, in the setting of Poincaré infinity categories. Um, so the, uh, a definition of L groups was already considered by Lurie. This is an equivalent definition that is given in the language of cobordism categories. So in order to define the nth group, we we take pi zero of this uh, cobordism category of C with Q shifted by minus n minus one. Uh, more concretely, what this means is that we take C with Q shifted minus n, we, and we, then we take cobordism classes of Poincaré objects. This, this set of uh, equivalence classes has a natural structure of an abelian group where addition is given by direct sum and the inverse is given by replacing a form by its minus. And for example, if we take the Poincaré infinity category, uh, whose underlying stable infinity category is the infinity category of perfect complexes over R, and we take the homotopy quadratic Hermitian structure, then we recover the classical quadratic L groups of all Ranitsky. So these are in particular are four periodic. And another example is that for the, punk, the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category of C, all L groups vanish. And we now arrive to the definition, uh, a principal definition um, from our point of view, the Grotendieck width space of a Poincaré infinity category. Um, and we define it as follows. We take the cobordism infinity category uh, of C. We take its classifying space or geometric realization um, so th this is like we had before in the case of span, so we can consider this, um, for example, as the infinity groupoid generated by the, inf the cobordism infinity category. Um, since this infinity category was directly obtained from a simplicial space, um, this geometric realization can also be directly obtained as the geometric realization of this simplicial space. Um, we then take the loop space at zero, and we define this to be the Grotendieck width space of the Poincaré infinity category C copa. Um, and the, the, the formation of direct sums again endows uh, the space with the structure of an infinity group. Uh, again, the first example is the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category, in which case, since the cobordism infinity category is the same as the span infinity category of C, we then get that the quantitic width space of the hyperbolic Poincaré infinity category is the loop of the span in of C, which is the algebraic theory space of C. So this definition recovers the uh, K-theory space of a stable infinity category. And if you consider now the case of um, the, the infinity category of perfect complexes uh, over a ring R, and, uh, and we take an invertible module with involution, in which case we had, I recall, uh, five Hermitian structures that we were interested in on the infinity category of perfect complexes. Uh, and so we write uh, for R any of these um, superscripts, we write the um, Gottendieck width space of this infinity category, we just write it Gottendieck width with this superscript Rm. And so a natural question would be, how would this compare to the classical Gottendieck width space? And here we have the comparison theorem of Heberstadt and Steimel, which says that there are natural equivalences between the genuine quadratic Gottendieck width space and the classical quadratic Gottendieck width space, that is the uh, Gottendieck width space of the genuine quadratic functor. And similarly, between the genuine even Gottendieck space recovers the classical even, the genuine symmetric recovers the classical symmetric Gottendieck width space. So, in summary, simply the Gottendieck width space of the genuine Poincaré structures uh, on these perfect uh, derived infinity categories recovers the classical Gottendieck width spaces, which are defined using uh, unimodular forms and group completions. 
and so we can ask so what happens if we take one of the two non genuine um, hermitian structures the homotopy quadratic hermitian structure and the homotopy symmetric hermitian structure and this then gives one new invariance of rings um, either space valued invariance or the homotopy groups so new, new higher gothendieck weight groups of rings and in some context in fact these invariants have better formal properties so for example the genuine symmetric one in the context of algebraic geometry um, is the one in which one can prove satisfies a1 invariance and so in the context of homotopy in motiv context of motivic homotopy theory it can be represented by a motivic spectrum um, this does not hold for any of the other four Hermitian structures here, including the genuine symmetric one. Now, if we take the group of components of this uh, infinity group, pi zero, we get what w uh, we then call the Gothendieck wheat group of a Poincare infinity category. And this group uh, admits an explicit uh, presentation in terms of generators and relations. Well, we take the generators to be equivalence classes of Poincaré objects, and we enforce the relation that whenever we have a metabolic Poincaré object with Lagrangian L, the class of X is equal to the hyperbolic class associated to L. And since, um, if we only care about cobordism classes, anything that is metabolic is cobordant to zero, everything that is hyperbolic is in particular metabolic is, and is hyperbolic to zero. So after taking Cobordism classes, this relation holds, and so this uh, the the association of modding out by cobordism classes determines a group homomorphism from the Gothendieck weed group to the L zero group, and this homomorphism fits in an exact sequence, um, where this is a quotient homomorphism of abelian groups, and this is a homomorphism from the algebraic uh, K zero group of C. Uh, defined in a similar manner to what we had before. So this map is induced by the formation of hyperbolic forms, and it descends to the uh, orbits of the C2 action, where the C2 action here is the one associated to the duality um, that is determined by COPA. And so we can ask, can we extend this sequence to the left, uh, involving all the natural higher replacements of these guys? So we have um, higher L groups, we have higher Gothendieck weed groups, we have higher K theory groups. Can this exact sequence be extended to the left? So I will address this question in the next lecture, in which I will also talk about the natural question of how this extension relates to the classical setting of rings. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next talks.